Well, I'll, uh, allow me a moment here to uh, introduce the, uh, the program and our speakers uh, here today. Um, as the first female editorial page editor at the nation's oldest continuously published newspaper, the Hartford Current, Carolyn Lumsden has used its fourth estate power for the greater good in advancing open government, fighting public corruption, and, av and advocating for the marginalized. She's thrown open the community pages of Connecticut's largest newspaper to a wide range of writers, given the fresh state, fresh ideas, and new ways of seeing issues. In 1992, she joined the editorial board at the Hartford Current. Her editorials on juvenile court secrecy led to the relaxation of state confidentiality laws that allowed journalists, victims, social workers, and police more access to cases. For this work, she was honored with the National Sigma Delta Chi Award and named Times Muir Journalist of the Year. Carolyn became commentary editor at The Current in 1995. She increased the range and quality of writers by adding the first Hispanic and African American columnist to the editorial pages and increasing the diversity of voices in letters and op-eds. She continues her work with the underrepresented writers as a mentor with the New York-based Op-Ed Project, which counsels women and people of color in leadership positions on writing op-eds. In 1998, Carolyn was granted a Knight Fellowship at the Yale Law School, which served her well in the critical thinking that is the foundation of great opinion writing. In 2003, Carolyn started PLACE, a unique weekly section on the state's architecture, land use, and physical environment that earned national attention. In 2004, concerned about the dearth of younger voices in journalism, Carolyn started Fresh Talk for writers under 30. More than a decade later, the weekly feature attracts writers from around the country. Carolyn returned to editorial writing in 2005 as deputy editorial page editor, and two years later, editorial page editor. Her editorials in 2005 to 2007 helped bring about historic reforms in Connecticut's courts that included opening judges' meetings to the public and letting cameras into courtrooms. Her staff's editorials on the state's obsession with records secrecy following the 2012 Newton Massacre earned national awards and may have kept some of the worst excesses at bay. In 2015, Carolyn was honored with the Yankee Quill Award, the highest individual honor bestowed on journalists in New England by the Academy of New England journalists. I might note that that's as a result of a lifetime worth of effort, not a single annual effort. Carolyn earned a bachelor's degree from Boston University and master's degrees from Stanford University and Yale Law School. She is married to Francesco Martini, a native of Italy, which they visited every year for three decades. They live in Suffield, Connecticut. Uh, following the forum today, we'll close with a benediction offered by Brigham Rog Rogers, a freshman biochemistry major from Virginia, members of faculty, staff, and students here at Southern Virginia, please join me in giving a warm welcome today to Jeff Benedict and Carolyn Lumsden. Welcome to Southern Virginia. Beautiful here. It is, especially this time of year. Uh, Carolyn, it's great to have you here, and uh, I think what, what we what we should do is, since we've just been through a historic uh, presidential campaign, and you've been responsible for writing the <coughs> editorials that the Harper Current have published about the campaign and the candidates, I think it might be interesting if we open by you explaining a little bit about the difference between journalists who cover a campaign and report on it and write stories about it versus what you do, which is you endorse candidates, you have to publish opinions on behalf of the newspaper. What was that like uh, over the last year? Yeah. Well, first of all, um, thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here. This is really a beautiful campus. Everyone has been so nice to me. Uh, so, yes. Um, for many years, I was an, a reporter uh, with the Associated Press in Boston and then with a small newspaper in Massachusetts and eventually um, went on to the opinion pages. I was a reporter. It was a lot of fun. Um, I 
reported. I, I told the story. As an opinion writer, I have to give the newspaper's opinion on the story. It's not my own personal opinion. It has to be the institutional opinion of the Hartford Sun. Now, that's a big responsibility uh, because the newspaper is 250 years old. So that sometimes requires going really far back in our um, archives to see what we said about something many years ago. But for as far as politics goes, uh, we, every election season, invite in candidates and um, interview them on TV. And then we make our decision based on their records, which one we will endorse for, um, for election and say why. Um, we are, we, okay few thoughts about that. First of all, we consider this our responsibility. We get asked every year, wh who are you to tell us who to vote for? So we explain that we're not telling you who to vote for. We're just saying that because we comment on the news, because we give our opinion of it 365 days a year, actually fewer days than that, but all the time, we feel like it's incumbent on us at election time to also give our opinion on the candidates. We have our job to talk to these people all the time and read up on them and see what they're doing. So, you know, we think that we have a little bit more sort of insight into who they are. And you're, of course, required to vote for them. That you're, We're just giving you the benefit of our insight. So, um, we are a, should I talk about our presidential? Well, let me ask you something. When you okay. The, uh, when you, Thank you. <laughs> when you have your own opinion about a candidate, but your job is to write the opinion of the newspaper, mm -hmm. there must be instances where you have to write uh, a piece endorsing a candidate that maybe personally you don't support. Yes. <laughs> because your job isn't to write your opinion, it's to write the opinion it's of the paper. The opinion of the paper. and. Okay, um, that's interesting. Um, so it's not my newspaper. It's the newspaper of uh, our company, Tronc. I report to the publisher. Um, the editorial board consists of me, my writer, an op-ed editor, and the publisher. Some years ago, not very long ago, a, uh, there was a race involving a Republican and a Democrat. Uh, and the publisher insisted on endorsing the Republican, who um, I just did not see as a great candidate. So this involved many conversations. Ultimately, I have to do what the, what the paper wants. I was able to persuade him that the Democrat's going to win. And you'll have to live with the next six years of this person being in office. Just think about that. Are you comfortable with that? You know, if if you didn't endorse him. And anyway, I'm, it was a persuasive argument. I managed to. So far, we have agreed. In other words, so far we've agreed. Not always. There have been lots of discussions, but we've managed to come to a meeting of minds on who to endorse. Okay. Um, I just think it's interesting because most people. Very few people get to write an, a, an opinion about a candidate that gets published for the world to see, like, this is who you should vote for. You're one person who gets to do that, and there's like 240,000 people reading the newspaper, and you're speaking for the publisher. And I was thinking uh, there may be times when you'd like to see someone else, or you're probably going to go into the booth and vote for someone different than whose name you put in the newspaper. Or maybe you've never done that. So far, <laughs> so far, my heart has been behind, not entirely, but marginally behind, you know, everyone. Everyone you've endorsed. endorsed. Yes, yes. Um, now, we only endorse this year in congressional races and Senate and Hartford legislative districts. And we have 
you know, have had years when we have said this year, we said we can't endorse either candidate. In this How come you didn't endorse for president this year? We did. We did oh, endorse. you did. Okay. We did endorse. Okay. We had a, and that was, again, a long conversation. Yes, we did. Okay. Um, let me switch gears because I know this is something that a lot of our students care about is how did you get, how did you get your start? As a writer, I mean, if I look at your academic credentials, you look like you sound like someone who should be at a college or university teaching, but you're not. And so, how did you go from Stanford and Yale to becoming a writer? How did that happen? It actually, sorry, it that's actually, probably better. <laughs> it was the reverse. Um, I was an English major and um, loved reading writers. I wasn't a particularly good writer, I have to say. Um, worked in book publishing because I loved reading. And um, by the way, everywhere I got was I really had to hustle. I really had to work hard to get there. To get into book publishing, I had to beg and plead and um, do everything I could, practically sweep floors to get there. So um, once there, wonderful opportunity had the had six years to study other writers see how they did it I actually was a copy editor so I had um, a great job of kind of learning the English language um, decided I want to write hustled 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 to get some a few clips a few stories um, wasn't easy and uh, with the basis of those stories um, and a lot of pleading, got into Stanford Journalism School, and then again, got out, graduated in a recession, no jobs. <laughs> uh, took a while before I finally got a reporting job on this tiny daily in Western Massachusetts. Even with a Stanford degree, I just couldn't, it was very hard. Um, so How much did you make in that first job? Uh, I made $11,000 a year, and this was in 1980. With a Stanford degree. With a Stanford degree. I made less. How'd that work for you? <laughs> I made less money. It's interesting that you asked. I made less money than anyone I covered on the job. I was the education reporter, and I did the cop speed, and all the public servants made more money than I did. And I started work at 6.30 in the morning, and I ended at night after the last meeting was over. So it's what you have to do sometimes. Um, and it gathered enough clips to go on to the Associated Press, again, begging and pleading, <laughs> uh, visiting, practically banging down the door of the editor to get a job there. I was hired only, oh, this can go on and on. I was hired only because I was a woman. Um, there was uh, the You were AP, hired because you were a woman? Yes. The AP was under a consent decree at the time because it didn't hire female reporters for ever for, until, and it, there was a consent decree in 1991. It had to hire a certain quota, a certain number of reporters, female reporters. I was one of them. I owe it to the federal courts that I got a job there. So um, again, I hustled. I did every kind of great story I could think of. I worked extra hours. I did everything I could to um, get a national story, which was the biggest honor you could, you know. And um, anyway, in the meantime, I. Met my husband, my husband to be, moved back to that tiny Massachusetts newspaper to be the editorial page editor because he lived there, and eventually got to the Hartford Current, and it was there that I applied for a journalism fellowship, and that's how I got to Yale Law School, and that was a wonderful year. Um, law school was easier than my job. <laughs> it was, uh, so just journalism is, I love it, but it's not an easy. Place. There's a lot of work involved. I think I would say the same thing. When I, I mean, I was when I was in law school, I, I thought it was hard until I did this. <laughs> this is way harder. Um, do you think it's? We have a lot of students here. Obviously, they're under 30, so that fits that part of it. But there's a lot of students here that would love to have a career in some form of writing. So we have students who want to write screenplays. We have students who want to write books. We have students who want to write who want to do what you do. Do you think it's any different today, right now, for <clears throat> a, a young person sitting in the audience who wants to sit here 
Is the, is the path different today than it was when you, you talked about hustling and scrounging. Is it any different today? Yes, yes. It's interesting that when I started, when I was um, in high school, women couldn't be writer reporters at Newsweek, the Associated Press, virtually there were none, New York Times. Now they call it a pink ghetto. Now there are, uh, can you hear me by the way? I'm sorry, I keep speaking here. Um, now, so many more opportunities. We're looking for women. We want people of color. It's more opening. It's more open. It's more welcome. Yes. Thank goodness. Yeah. yeah. I want to read. I want to read you something. Um, <coughs> this uh, <coughs> this is about writing, and I'm, I'm just. I want to read you a quote from uh, Bruce Springsteen's new autobiography, and he talks a lot about writing in his book. Uh, and I want to read you something he said, and I want to know if you agree with what he said. This is what he said about writing. He said, uh, if you have the raw talent to write, you can't will yourself there. But if you have the talent, then will, ambition, and the determination to expose yourself to new thoughts, counterarguments, new influences, will strengthen and fortify your work and drive you closer to home. Home meaning becoming a writer. Do you agree with him when, you, when he says, if you don't have the raw talent, you can't will yourself there? No. <laughs> you have the raw talent. You write beautifully. You write in a way that is so easy to read and understand. I had to labor at it. I had to study it. I had to figure out how do you break down this sentence so some I had I had to read about the art of writing, how the craft of writing, how to do it. I had it took me years to figure out how to write a good lead paragraph. It did not come easy to me. Some people have to learn it, but everybody can learn it. No, I don't think you need raw talent to do it. I think it is learnable. I think it's learnable. Yes. So you don't have to be gifted. If you're fortunate, like you are. You're gifted. I'm not gifted. Now, you I mean, told this interesting story last night about I asked how did you learn how to write in this such a readable way. Right. And can you just tell that? I thought that was so interesting about the workers. Well, we, so we had a bunch of students that are um, from the Institute. Uh, we had a dinner last night, and the students had like a fireside chat with Carolyn about writing, and, and uh, I don't remember how this came up, but she had asked me a question about, uh, what did exactly did you ask me? I know what I said, but what did you ask? How did you learn how to write in such a way, easy to read way? Oh, way right, right, right. Yeah, conversation. yeah so, and I, what I said to the students and Carolyn last night in answering that was that uh, I've never taken any writing classes, but, uh, I had some jobs before, when I got out of college, and like a lot of you, I was really anxious about getting a job, and there, it was hard to find a job. And so my first job out of college <coughs> was I literally dug ditches in Connecticut. My, my uncles owned a foundation business, so they would build the foundations that houses sit on. So my job was to, we would dig, these, dig the holes underground that you pour the cement in. It was just backbreaking physical grunt labor but it was good money, and it was a job. And I did that, and then I got a job at night. I was a manager at a homeless shelter in the town next to ours. And, um, and then my third job was I was a janitor, uh, actually for the Mormon church back when they used to pay janitors. And so those were my three jobs. And what I said last night in my answer about learning how to write is that I didn't know it at the time, but working on a construction site, working in a homeless shelter, uh, cleaning toilets, <laughs> I learned, it, it was something I learned it, but if you can speak the language of those folks who I was working with, you can speak with anybody. And um, when I write for Sports Illustrated, our, sto our stories that go in Sports Illustrated, we're told, my editor would always tell me, to try to write something that an eighth grader could read and get absorbed in. Because a lot of people who read our magazine don't read much else. And so 
you could look at that and say, well, you're writing down. You know, that's not very sophisticated. But what I think is that if, you, if the idea is to try to reach a large audience and get people to read your, whatever you're writing, you have to speak their language. And it's not easy to write that way. But you learn how to write that way by conversing with people that way. So you write what you're, how you speak. And I found that to be really useful tool. And so when I'm reading, if I get through a paragraph that I've written and then I reread it, and I see sentences that are long or that have words in them that people might have to look up in a dictionary, I take the word out, and I'm always trying to shorten sentences. I, if I can get a sentence that's got four words in it, that's a great sentence. You know, um, my favorite sentence in the Bible is two words. Jesus wept, period. It's a great sentence. It says a ton, and it's two words. And so if you can get sentences that tight, then I think you can, it's, it's not only easy to read, but it's easy to get people to see, you know, what they're, what they're reading. And, and another thing he talks about in his book about writing is he says, Writing, he's talking about songwriting, but it's the same principle as book writing or newspaper writing. He talks about writing is in the details. It's the twist of the ring. It's the flip of a baton. I just gave you two sentences that were like four words long, and, and everybody here can visualize someone twisting the ring or a child tossing a baton. You can see it. That's good writing. Simple. Very simple. Simple to you. <laughs> <laughs> it took me just, 30 years to learn it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just think that that, though, what gets lost, I guess, sometimes in translation when we're trying to teach students how to write, it's not about having an impressive vocabulary that you show off with people. Writing isn't about showing off. It's, it's not about the writer. It's about the subject. And I, this is the other thing I talked about last night. When a woman gets in bed at night, and pulls the covers up over her and grabs a book off the nightstand, she wants to go somewhere. She wants to escape. And if you write well, you can take her there. If you don't write well, she's going to start reading and fall asleep. <laughs> but what's better is her husband wakes up in the morning and goes, you were up all night. And she says, yeah, I couldn't put the book down. You know, That's what we're talking about. Yeah. Yes. And... Um as we were saying last night, I don't know if this is on topic or off topic, but um, what we discovered at the newspaper, I also, I'm in charge of the page that does op-eds, um, writing from the community, 700 word essays. And for years, newspapers thought, okay, the best op-eds are written by authorities on topics, professors, think tanks, et cetera. Well, when a couple of years ago, we started to track who's actually reading op-eds um, online, hour by hour, minute by minute, and we could assemble the 10, 25 most read op-eds, we discovered to our astonishment, I mean the most read pieces in the entire paper, we were astonished to learn that the past two years, the top most read pieces in the entire newspaper were not sports stories, they were op-eds. And they were op -eds. Whoa, sorry. Uh, they were op they were op-eds written by um, real people, by everyday people. Can you hear me? I feel like oh, I just went dead. There you go. Uh, yeah, there were op-eds written by real people, everyday people, writing about a teacher on why she wanted to quit teaching, um, a student who was embarrassed by a drunken student who showed up in the student union. That was number one last year. So this completely changed our point of view of what people want to read uh, and what we thought they should read, which was fascinating to me. Also, the top, the, the top two pieces of the past two year, years were written by women, which was also um, kind of surprised everybody. We just thought it would be, we thought it would be a male reporter for the current who would grab the top slot. He wasn't close. Very surprised. We thought it would be the sports columnist who's enormously popular. But no, <laughs> because teachers around the country were taking that article, Why I Want to Quit Teaching, which was about, she was just, the teacher was so frustrated by Common Core, do you have Common Core? Uh, testing, constantly having to test her students. It was, and she had a wonderful visual image of, you know, being home at night, 
knowing she had to do her laundry, but she couldn't do it because she had to prepare for this, you know, Common Core test. Um, it was, it was um, passed around the country. Everyone was um, Facebooking it and emailing it to, to other teachers. It was on teachers, you know, in the, what do you call the break rooms. They had copies on their tables. So that, it, we figured it had two to four million views in that year. People are still reading it. Uh, and that was the same thing with the um, mac and cheese kid um, op-ed last year. Uh, that it was just distributed by college students to other college students. It's, a, it's an interesting new world. <laughs> well, it, and it would be encouraging, because if we have students here, I mean, you get asked all the time, how do I, how do I get my first piece published? In fact, if, if I were to ask you that question, if I'm 22 and I'm a junior at Southern Virginia University and I really want to write, how, how can I get started? Like today, what would be, short of, what isn't going to happen? You're not going to get a publishing contract. Sports Illustrated is not going to call you and ask you to write a story, and you're not going to get published on the op-ed page of the New York Times. So, what could I do? I recommend uh, trying to get an op-ed in somewhere. I think one of the best places to learn how to write op-eds is to look at the New York Times. Um, essays, op-eds, they have many categories. One is called Modern Love. They're great examples of the sort of irresistible reading by, you know, all of us that... Um, anybody. Anybody that, um, that uh, you know, you could learn from. There's a site online called theopedproject.org, which has a list of all of the top 200 newspapers in the country, what they're looking for in op-eds, who the editor is, what the email address is, what the requirements are. Go there, try to find your newspapers in your area, look at your op-ed, those op-ed pages, those editorial pages, figure out what they want, try to write something local, pertaining to a local issue, or your experience, um, on a particular issue, narrow it down, make the lead 25 words or less. Um, it's interesting to hear you say that because when I started writing 21 years ago, the, the rules were the opposite of that. Don't talk about yourself. No one's interested in your story. You know, find somebody famous to write about, which is I know what you did. That's how you got started. Yeah. You wrote your first piece about somebody famous, mm -hmm. and that got you your clips. Yeah. And I did the same thing. I wrote about O.J. Simpson, who'd been charged with killing his wife. I mean, I, that's, what, that's what I'm writing about. Today, what's I think encouraging for students is there's so many platforms today. Yeah. That, and, and there actually is a tremendous interest in your own narrative. Like, what is your story? Mm -hmm. NPR has a whole site that encourages you to tell your story. Newspapers today, even including the New York Times, they'll still publish, you know, the the Mitt Romney op-ed and the, you know, the CEO of GE, his op-ed. But they'll also take someone you've never heard of who comes out of nowhere, who's 29 years old and has never written anything in their life, but because something really interesting happened to them, if they can write, they can get published. That's the better read op-ed. If you look at the top 10 op-eds of the New York Times, you won't see the CEO in there. You'll see the personal piece, the I. This is what is so surprising to us what we've learned from the New York Times, thank you, New York Times, is the I word is irresistible to people. The personal story is irresistible to people. Uh, and the personal story of someone they can relate to, they can't relate to Jack Welch in a sense. Right. But so anyway, yeah. Let me switch gears and ask you a question about gender. Uh, What's been the hardest thing being a journalist and being a woman? Well, so getting that first job was the hardest thing. <laughs> and then proving yourself. And proving yourself on your own merit, not because, forgive me, not because People think you flirted with the boss, which is very common, 
but you know, a reader out there doesn't know your office politics. The reader only knows whether your story shows up in his or her newspaper. So showing that I could write a story that would show up in a Florida newspaper or a California newspaper was a huge accomplishment. That's what I set out to do. And that I could do it not just once, but several times. So that was um, proving yourself, basically. That you can do it despite the um, stereotype that, you know, oh, you know, really a man, only a man can really kind of parachute into a foreign place and get all the facts to write the story. Okay, so here's one example. So I was such an eager beaver, I was up every morning and out the door by 7 o'clock going to my next assignment for the AP. So I was headed on an assignment at 7 a.m. when I got a call that said, you're the only person up and around and available. Can you go to the airport, Boston, right now? There's a, a plane just crashed in Gander, Canada, 265 servicemen on it, uh, coming home from a peacekeeping mission in the Middle East. So I went there. I, you know, land in Canada. I don't know anything. And I have to quickly file a story within two hours. You know, it was thought that, and a male reporter once said to me, you know, only really a guy can do that. So this was the sort of um, stereotype you were up against, and you had to really prove yourself. If you were talking to your daughter today, if your daughter was, well, my daughter's age, my daughter that's 14 and who thinks she wants to go into publishing, that's what she thinks now anyways, would your advice to her be any different than it was when you were coming in? As you know, your experience is far more interesting than my experience. Um, to be successful in writing, you have to work hard but think harder <laughs> and think, how am I going to get that story? Not only how am I going to get that story, but how am I going to promote it? How am I going to make sure the most possible people can see it? So I would just warn her that law might be easier. <laughs> law might be easier. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But I'll tell you, I wouldn't trade it for the world. The places I've been, the people I've met, you know, the stories I've been able, you know, here, I'm here. This is wonderful. I, it, it's been a wonderful adventure. I, you know what? Actually, I, I agree with that because uh, – Funny story, I'll just, this audience will get this because two months ago here, we brought a, a filmmaker here from NFL Films who made a film about Steve Young's life, and we, we premiered it here and we showed it. So back in September, all of our students watched that film. And uh, for the last six weeks, Steve's been on a book tour promoting his autobiography, and I've been with him, and our last day was Monday, and we did a bunch of events in Greenwich, Connecticut, his hometown, and then we finished up in New York at a Monday night football game. And here's a, this is a true story, but you talked about the need to promote your work, and that's the part, as writers, a lot of you students who want to be writers might not think about this as an important part of being a writer, but you have to think about this if it's going to be a profession, is it's not just about writing, then it becomes about selling. And selling is the part that a lot of writers don't want to do, but this is a true anecdotal story about that is Monday night, Steve Young, you know, he's on TV with ESPN every week because he's an analyst for the Monday night football games. And I have been trying to get ESPN to say something about his book on the air for six weeks and they won't do it. They will not do it, even though he's one of their guys. And I was getting really aggravated. And so <laughs> I asked our publisher, Houghton Mifflin, if they'd ship me a couple of cases of books. And I had my son with me, and we went to the Monday night game with Steve Monday night, and we lugged cases of books into MetLife Stadium, which is like, it's like hiking two miles to get from the parking lot up inside the stadium with these boxes of books. And, and a lot of weird looks from people like, who are these guys? Like, what are they carrying? Well, even when we went through security, the dogs were sniffing the boxes, and the security officers like, what are in these? But we had to rip the boxes open so they could see that there's just books in here. And um, 
We got him inside, and my, my plan was, if you ever watch a Monday Night Football game, there's a ton of fans that come early because they want to get on TV. And they all pile up right in the front rows of the stadium where the ESPN portable studio is set up. And they scream and yell, so whenever they go to commercial break, ESPN pans the camera around so you can see all these crazy fans. And they bring signs and everything because they want to be on television. So I, I lugged these two cases of books into the stadium. And while the broadcast was going on right here, I opened these books up and started tossing them up into the stands. And people like stampeded to get the books. And they pretty soon they're all leaning over screaming, can I have a book, can I have a book? And within no time, the whole section of the bleachers had a Steve Young book. And uh, you know, not this book, but you know, Steve's book. And, they're, and they're, they were all going, is this gonna get us on TV? And I said, if you hold that book up, <laughs> When the camera comes to you, you will be on TV. <laughs> and so we go to the commercial break. The ESPN camera spins around, and everybody in the stands is holding up the book. <laughs> and we got on TV. And, but it was, <laughs> it was a way of getting you know, two and a half million people watching at home to go, oh. And, and it was funny, because there were these ESPN production people sitting there, and one guy goes to the other guy. I was standing right next to them, and one guy goes, What's going on? Has somebody got a book out or something? And the other guy goes, yeah, I, th I think it's something about quarterback, and I don't know. <laughs> they had no idea that it was Steve, who's their guy, you know? And, and so it's just, I think part of when you're talking about writing for a living, there's a lot of things you have to think about doing that go beyond stringing together good sentences, figuring out a way to make the transitions work, coming up with a story that's captivating, that people actually want to read. Once you accomplish all that, which is a huge feat, but once you get there, it's like, OK, now how do we get people to know about it? How do, how do people find out in the world of publishing, where there's 10,000 books published every month in this country, how do they know about yours? Because there's only 20 on the New York Times list, and there's thousands that are for sale. H how do you? break out of that big group and get yours out there. And I think it's interesting for young people who want to write today is there's a way now that a student who's never published can actually get visibility. If they have something to say or they've had an experience that's unique, there's platforms, there's Facebook, there's Huffington Post, there's, mm -hmm. there's these websites where you can get published and we'll say, well, what's your track record? Well, I don't have a track record. I've never written before, but I, I have something. That, did, that was not like that when we were trying to break in. That's absolutely true. Yeah, Huffington Post has a site, I think, for young people. We also publish every Wednesday um, a, an, an essay by someone under 30. And uh, we get submissions from all over the country. We just want it to be Connecticut-related in some way. Uh, but yeah. How, how important do you think humility is as a quality for a writer? a great question. The, and the only way that it's coming to me right now is in being edited. Is that where you're leading? Because I have to say that the best writers, and I worked with writers at Random House. I was a copy editor there, and I would have to put in a comma here or take change who to whom or something like that. Those who tended to accept my suggestions were professionals. Those who resisted were not. And I, even the professionals, if they didn't accept my suggestion, they gave me a reason why. They showed, showed me a style book did. I think humility helps when you're being edited because the person reading wants to improve your writing. But your ego is so invested in what you've written, it's so hard to get, hear someone criticize your work. That's one place in which I think humility would help. The, be the best editor that I ever had for book editing um, was the one who uh, put the most red, red ink on my pages. I remember the first time I got a manuscript back from him, it was literally like, oh my gosh. He has pulverized what I wrote. M meaning I, my first thought was, I'm, I have, have written horribly here. 
horribly because it was so much red ink on the page. And when I called him, I, I expressed that to him, and he goes, no, no, no. He goes, it's not written horribly. He said, but I think you ha actually have the potential. There's a level that you have, you're not reaching that I think you have the capacity to reach. Like the raw material is on the page. I can tell you've done the work. You've done the research. You have a great story, but it's not well told. And I want to help you tell it well. And if you'll let me, if you'll let me lead you, you'll be able to do this on your own. And that actually proved to be true. It, I, you know, it was like having a, this genius editor who taught me how to write by taking the raw stuff that I'd put on paper, which wasn't terrible, but it wasn't great. I mean, it was just, it, it was okay. And he was like, do you want to have okay? I was like, no, I don't want to be okay. He's like, well, okay, then follow me here. Let me do this. And I thought it was, I was not embarrassed after I l realized what was going on. Like, I wasn't embarrassed, and I didn't feel like, oh, geez. It was more like, wow, this could be, this could be, all. I was reading his sentences, like what he'd done with my sentences, and I was like, wow, that is so good. And it actually, once we did that together, the next time that I wrote chapters for him, there was a lot less ink on the page because I really was just copying these simple techniques that I saw him using on, in the editing. Mm -hmm. And that's why I was wondering, because I have friends, and I'm sure you do too, who complain, like, they hate getting edited. I hate getting edited. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, someone's got to edit you. It's necessary. You've got to have another set of eyes, and it can't be your family members, by the way. <laughs> yeah. They're not going to be honest with you. Uh, or they love you so much, they think what you write is wonderful. Um, that is so true, actually. The worst thing to do is ask your friend to read your stuff, because they're going to read it and go, oh, it's great. That was so great when it's not. Yeah, yeah. But they won't tell you, this is not really that good. Yeah, yeah. So, but I want to hear the OJ story. <laughs> well, we got to be really quick, because we're out of time, right? Um, Dallas, are we out of time? What time? Five minutes? Just O.J. Simpson, for me, like, I, I wasn't trying to be sensational or anything, but I, I, when I was in graduate school, I was doing a thesis on violence against women by athletes. And when I was working on my thesis, the incident happened in Brentwood between O.J. and his wife, and it became the story. And it was the first time that the country was really paying attention to the idea that athletes get a different standard of justice when they abuse a woman. Because they're famous, because they're wealthy, because they're protected, because there's a lot of powerful people who have a vested interest in them staying on the field. Now, OJ was retired by that point, but the principles there were the same. And so I got my start in writing by writing about that subject. And when I wrote about it, I was a student like these many of these students here. I mean, I was a graduate student, but I was a student. And a New York Times columnist, I sent him my thesis. I, I mailed it to him. He didn't have email. I mailed it to him, thick document. And then without me asking him to, I didn't send it to him hoping he'd write about it. I sent it to him because I knew it was an issue he'd written about in the Times. And I thought he, maybe he'd be interested in what I wrote, which was kind of presumptuous on my part. But Next thing I know, he called me up and said, I'm going to write a column about your thesis. And he did. And uh, it changed my life. I mean, in a day, like Dan Rather called and said, we want to interview on the CBS Evening News. I'm like, what? <laughs> you know, <laughs> this craziness. But that, that was, it started that fast. You know, Brian Williams, uh, Matt Lauer, all those guys were calling the little office that I worked in, which was a job for me at the school, wanting to talk to me about what the New York Times had said about my thesis. The reason they were doing that, though, is because O.J. Simpson and Mike Tyson were in the news, and they were looking for voices, new voices, fresh voices. That's the thing, fresh voices who could talk about this subject. And here was a, here's this guy who's in Boston at grad school. He's 20, I was 24 or 5 or something, and had never written anything. And suddenly I was on national TV talking to Dan Rather about violence against women. And suddenly going, holy cow, like, this is, 
remarkable, but it was just because I'd written something that no one else had written. So, mm -hmm. so I agree with you in terms of, if I were talking to students, I'd say, there is no better time than now. If you want to write, if you want to make something, the, the opportunities that are there today, they're, they're, they're fantastic. It's not discouraging, it's encouraging. And that's not to say that there's not um, room on op-ed pages for professors. <laughs> we also want them. But we want them to write more as humans and less as experts and authorities, if that makes any sense. Because readers just are so drawn to you know, the personal story. So yes, professors, please send in your op-eds. <laughs> She's soliciting. For the Roanoke Times. <laughs> <laughs> Carolyn, thank you so much. I mean, we could go on here, but uh, it's been wonderful having you come to Southern Virginia. Terrific presentations last night for our students, and uh, great to have you here today. Thank, thank you. Thank you. It's been great. Thanks.